Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Phil Gardner. Uh, he is the director for the Collegiate Employment Research Institution and also serves as the director for Career Services Network at Michigan State. He has served over 30 years at the institution, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, college football earlier and I was taking plenty of notes, uh, but Dr. Gardner has been doing this program all 13 years here at the University of Tampa. Uh, he's been extremely instrumental with our Associate Dean Tim Harding in um, putting together our competencies, uh, which is Spartan Ready. Uh, and some of the interesting areas for research uh, you know, is trans that he does for his research includes transition from college to work, early work placement, so all of you here today, student engagement, learning, competency development, again, our Spartan Ready program, labor market uh, dynamics for the college educated, but then also the impact of first and second year students um, can, you know, at colleges continuing to learn. So I think with the disruption of virtual learning, we're going to get to hear a lot about what Dr. Gardner has to say. With that, Dr. Gardner, I am going to mute myself, which I imagine a lot of my colleagues will be excited uh, to have me stop talking and get to hear you in today's presentation. So let's give Dr. Gardner a virtual welcome. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be back here with, in Tampa. Um, and I especially want to thank the University of Tampa and University of South Florida for sponsoring this uh, event for the 13th year. I don't think Tim Harding and I imagined it would get, be this um, large or uh, dynamic uh, when we thought it up, uh, when Tim thought it up 13 years ago, but it's proven to be probably one of my um, most uh, rewarding events, uh, the people uh, engaged. And I have to say that everyone is he, that is attending, it was special because at the beginning of the week, I started getting emails from folks that were uh, that I don't usually get before presentations from uh, the, the uh, Florida area, excited about uh, being able to come and share ideas uh, this Friday. So I appreciate all of you for your long time continued support. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna break this talk into three parts. I'm gonna talk about full-time hiring uh, outlook. Uh, then I'm gonna uh, shift to early talent management programs. This is your internships uh, and co-ops and other work-based uh, learning opportunities. Then I'm gonna talk about how the, some of the influence that technology has had and will continue to have on college recruiting. And at the end, at the very end, I'm gonna do a quick summary of some of the regional statistics uh, for you, uh, just to, after everything, you can see how it plays off. And then um, as far as resources go, uh, you're, there's resources that you can tap into. The main recruiting trend report is located at our website and it's at this website and it can be downloaded. Um, rather than have Matt or uh, distribute that report, we're asking that uh, you download it from that port so we can get a count. Uh, it's gonna be a part of the information based what, about the future of recruiting trends um, after this this year is, is just how, ma how many people are using that report. There's also a regional port for the Southeast that includes the states of Florida, Georgia, and uh, South Carolina, uh, North and South Carolina. Uh, and that's available and Matt has that and all the attendees will receive that at the end of the program. The PowerPoint PDF has uh, been shared with Matt and you will have that. And as Matt said, it's being recorded and that'll be available to you. Uh, if beyond that, if you have any questions or thought, uh, ideas and you need to get in touch with me, just feel free to reach out. And then we'll have time for question and answers at the end. So I'm gonna start this by talking a little bit about the economy. Now, if you, just for background, the data for this report is collected at, at, in the latter part of um, August, and then most of it is collected uh, in the first three, four weeks of September, right as the college recruiting season usually kicks off. And uh, so it's, it's relatively new, it's current. Um, but with the situation this year, um, with regards to the COVID, uh, the, 
the normal economic cycle has continually been disrupted. And so what's happened is some of the th dynamics that were in present in this in September may not be in play now. So the point here is that when you uh, look at the data I present and the data that uh, your individual organization situation or the region you're in may be different or may have gone through several changes since then. I noticed uh, in the poll, I glanced at some of those, um, you'll see a big difference in some of the in your internship responses, but then uh, you're a little bit more positive on hiring than uh, the rest of the country, at least with the groups that are here. But so let me jump in with some, some points to make about the economy. Uh, of course, the main focus from my point of view is jobs and what's going on with regards to jobs. And we've lost a lot of jobs due to this, to the virus. And what I'm emphasizing here is th they're going, going, and maybe gone. And we don't know if, if how fast jobs are going to recover, excuse me, and how fast other factors may influence uh, how, how the workplace is realigned after COVID and, and the impact on jobs. Uh, just to put some context around this, um, so far uh, in the first nine months of COVID, starting in, at the first of March, we lost in the neighborhood of 1.12 million to 13.5 million jobs. Uh, some of those came back uh, rather quickly, but only less, actually less than half. And in what we've seen most of the latter part of the summer into early fall was a small but incremental increases in, 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 in jobs. Uh, but what's happened in the last three months is those job gains have been uh, mitigated by the, a, a rather strong increase in unemployment. And that's what we're seeing right now. Um, just to put this in, in a historical perspective, when we, um, uh, had this situation in 2008. We lost 7.5 million jobs due to that recession uh, and quite quickly. Uh, and it, what's interesting is out of that recession, we gained 8.5 million jobs, but it took us a, quite a while to do that. Uh, and a lot of the people that lost jobs, those weren't the jobs that were replaced. They were different jobs, different locations, uh, involving different kind of dynamics, uh, requiring different skills. So there was a lot of adjustment that had to go on to, to write the, um, the labor market and the workplace after that recession. And the same thing is expected to happen this time. We're seeing uh, technology make some uh, rather noticeable differences in the workplace. A lot of it's coming in areas that have been stressed like health uh, and agriculture and places that have had uh, situations where they've been cons labor constraints. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of work alignment going on. So when we come out of this, it's gonna take time and we're not gonna get all those jobs back quickly. I will say that uh, knowledge worker jobs fared much better uh, than the other side of the economy. And a lot of the jobs that were lost, almost uh, 70, 70 to 75% of the jobs lost were lower middle income jobs. Uh, and they ha are not coming back as quickly. The other thing you're going to see in this data, it's quite clear um, that we're having a cake recovery. There's nothing seems to be fair about this. Uh, in the sense that some are benefiting significantly from this uh, as they move ahead and the economy is still working in their favor and other uh, are not uh, doing well at all. And it's happening in with the same subsector of the economy such as uh, marketing, advertising, and events. Uh, those mar there's marketing firms out there that are and PR firms and that are hiring uh, because their clients are doing well. And we've got similar uh, kinds of firms and establishments that are having to either drastically cut back or close because their clients aren't doing so well. We see it in the same within industry. Uh, for example, uh, when we took the report in September, uh, the manufacturing center with, in the automotive aerospace, uh, for example, was not doing well, uh, except that defense aerospace was uh, keeping that as somewhat um, 
from sinking. Uh, but uh, what's happened in the last couple months is uh, the auto sector has improved. They, we went, uh, folks went on a hiring bid of new, of new cars in November and December. So production is back up a little bit. Doesn't mean that they pulled a lot of people back in, but it's a little more positive. So you can see how rapidly some of these things are changing. You're going to see that uh, in this report. Uh, trade uh, is, it has been ironically uh, a, a place where we, uh, we haven't been looking at recently, but with all the, 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 all the tariffs and everything are still in place, it's hurt some sectors significantly. Ag has, has, a pro, has had immense problems doing, due to the uh, ability to import and export food. Um, but what's really interesting for you to keep track of economic data, uh, we have set a historical record beginning in November and did it again in December of our trade balance. We're importing, importing more goods than we ever have at the same time we're exporting uh, goods and services at the lowest level we ever had. So we have the hard, largest trade gap uh, and we're on pace to set records. We continue to buy. It doesn't seem to stop Americans from buying from uh, China at all. So we're going to have to reset that. Um, and uh, I guess the, what I've heard from the people that I talked to, uh, it, it'll be slowly readjusted. I don't think uh, the new administration is going to jump in yet on what they're going to do about trade. I think they're going to seriously look at where they're at and, and then ease those tariffs where, they, where it's most appropriate. Uh, the other thing that's clearly come out of um, this COVID is the inequality uh, is everywhere. It's not only in uh, among individuals that I think everybody here well knows. Uh, some people have done very, very well during this uh, economy and others are, are really struggling. But it's also on the organizational size. Um, the big is eating the small and uh, the, the bigger companies that can you get bigger. We've seen a huge loss uh, of small businesses across the country. Many of them, of course, in the uh, food service, uh, dining and uh, hospitality side, as in, and that's a big deal in Florida. Um, but uh, we, we, for example, um, Amazon it, during the, starting in um, not, with the onset of the COVID has been making about thousand dollars a second uh, and, and and just eating up e trade e sales and others companies have been doing the same and so we've got this big imbalance uh, that we've never seen before to such a magnitude and, and something will have to be done about that um, the other thing that's interesting and of course it has a strong political overtone, but it, it raises some issues for us is the big 30, 70, 70-30 uh, split you saw, and not only in the way that the country voted, but how it aligned economically. And, that, and if you haven't heard about this, uh, the blue areas that voted blue uh, actually generates 70% of the economy and the red areas uh, only generate about 30%. And that area is shrinking. We have a huge problem uh, in particularly rural red areas about sustaining the economy, about how, what kind of, what can we really do economically? Uh, we, we haven't addressed that. And uh, colleagues in career services that work with rural populations have really been challenged um, the last uh, four years about the role of higher education, the role of advanced credentials past high school, and what kind of opportunities of that uh, exist. And, and this questions are going to have to be asked significantly. I think the fun part, uh, and one we'll talk about more, is the biggest experiment besides trying to find a vaccine has been the emergence of hybrid workplaces and the remote and the remote work. And it, this is going to have a significant impact uh, on all of us. Uh, depending on your the kind of work you do. So let's start with full-time positions. Uh, let's little talk about what's going on. If you've been with me before, you've seen this uh, figure grow over the, the last 10, 11 years as we recovered from the uh, uh, 
recession in 2008, we began to re respond in the academic year 2010-11, and you see that we've had a steady, steady increase. In, and since 2014-15, since we've had really impressive labor markets. Uh, in um, the fall of 2019, when we did our survey and, I, and then in January, when I was with you in Tampa, we were projecting a 10% increase. You can see that on the far right with that light green uh, bar. And when I left Tampa, I went to Morocco and barely got home as the airplanes were closed down. Uh, and by the time I got back, everything uh, was in turmoil and employers were having to um, readjust their hiring expectations and what they reasonably could do. And you can see that little jagged line. Uh, I can't really determine yet, and you'll see in a minute why, just how many jobs were lost uh, due to the rapid uh, increase of COVID and closing down so much part of the economy and how what options employers had to adjust. Um, so just to give you an idea, we did ask employers how they plan to adjust full-time hiring. Uh, and what did they did in the spring? And you can see that 25% of the organizations suspended recruiting and withdrew positions if they'd already made offers. Um, and then 75% continued. They either stopped recruiting and worked with the students that they had identified in the fall and early winter, or they continued to virtually adjust uh, working with career services using virtual technologies and made offers as planned. Um, now, it, it doesn't mean that because 25% of these companies uh, had to withdraw their offers that that corresponded 25% of the jobs on the table. Uh, it's not as easy as that, and it's really hard to determine. Uh, based on that, I, you know, based on what I my gut, and it's not based on numbers, I think the market probably softened, weakened by about 3%, maybe no more than 4%. So at the at the end of the academic year, so when we reached spring, uh, the market was still in pretty good in a pretty good place for most students. If the students had started their job search in the fall, had been active, had been uh, working uh, steadily, even if they hadn't had contacts, they would have been in place uh, to take uh, capture uh, those jobs that were on the table and available. Uh, for students that waited until January to start their job search, those that uh, often wait until after spring break to start their job search for uh, May. They probably were in a very difficult position as many companies had to wait and see what was gonna happen and didn't really begin to open up again until um, summer. And so there was a delay, but there is a benefit coming up to those that didn't uh, actually get attached. And you'll see that in a minute. Um, so when we entered this, um, fall, uh, the first question was, what, how are they gonna, companies going to approach COVID? How were we going to uh, deal with COVID as far as college recruiting went? And so we did ask this question, and 25% of the companies that responded said that uh, we were not going to engage in college recruiting at all this year. We're going to delay that decision until we evaluate in January or February. Um, and they were likely to be in manufacturing and they were likely to be in uh, the big sector business professional scientific services in, the, in one important and a couple important subsectors and one of that being engineering services. Engineering services had contracted quite a bit. Uh, and they were among very small employers, as you might expect, that they were, uh, the uncertainty was too much for them to consider adding employment. But this is where one of the uh, anomalies in the data, this data is, you're going to see these are the some of the same employers that are going to hire aggressively. Now, in following up this group, I haven't talked to but a couple of them. Uh, and I will just insert here that most of these people in this group that were waiting to reevaluate, be given the situation currently and, and expected to last and through uh, early spring uh, until the vaccine takes hold or uh, the cases slow down, but it's going to be a couple months if longer for that. Most of these companies are um, 
actually probably point out of college recruiting at this time. They're not going to go ahead and because it's just a, too uncertain of what, what the situation's like. Uh, they have the tools so they can jump back in at any time. And since it's going to be virtual and they aren't going to be able to get on campus, uh, they may not be at a, at a huge disadvantage. Um, 13% said that they would uh, rely on their own in-house virtual technology with little interaction with college campuses. Uh, so that means just under around 40% of the employers that we would normally see on campus or expect to have inter uh, more visible interactions are actually removed from college uh, scene right now. That leaves that about 44% said they were gonna just in, be in virtual, entirely virtual recruiting, um, working closely with career centers and campus connections. And then I did sort of pull out this other group, they're gonna use virtual, or, but they'd really love to be on campus and it, they would attend to personal events if possible. Unfortunately, that's not gonna happen this year as most in nearly every campus I know is going to stay closed. But you can see that uh, the number of companies that were actively on campus is down. Uh, uh, considerably. It uh, doesn't mean recruiting's down, but a lot of employers are having to wait this out and see what's going to happen. The next question, uh, but there were some other things that were going on that they also said that they were doing in lieu of college recruiting. The biggest one was just-in-time hiring. Now, um, this is not a new on new concept. We've had just-in-time hiring for a long, long time, but the shift to just-in-time hiring accommodates uh, this oscillations in the COVID disruptions uh, because you don't want to hire somebody and then hit uh, a situation where you have to slow down or uh, and stop work until you, uh, for a period of time uh, and then back in business again. So just-in-time hiring uh, allows you to do that and not be dependent on graduation dates and things like that. But it also takes advantage of a, uh, available experience labor. There's a lot of experienced labor out there uh, and in the class of 2020. So there's a good sign for 2020 is employers said, well, I don't have to go on campus. I've got these students that are still looking for jobs from 2020. They're highly competent. So uh, we'll, we'll just dabble them. We can get them on board when we, and work them in uh, depending on the virus and we don't have to wait for graduation. Another thing that's going on uh, that is the re, um, designation of full-time positions to part-time positions to address the work demands that, are, that result from COVID. Uh, you can't stay in operation at full capacity uh, that, or uh, your, the, the clients you serve are not, are at not full capacity, so you don't need uh, full-time staff, so you change some of your positions to part-time employers. The last thing I always find is fun is that how many of you actually honestly admit that instead of uh, uh, going out and finding somebody new, we're just going to reconnect with our interns, former co-ops or students that work with us at one time, and we'll just poach them from somebody else. It happens all the time, but uh, I find that, and that's only a small number, but it is happening. Um, so now going into this fall, uh, the big question is, what are you going to do? How active are you going to recruit? Now, you'll see in here that this 5% from uh, they don't plan to hire at all. That's really, really those in that small group of that are going to reevaluate. Uh, they, they came in here uh, and, and, I, and I likely they are not going to probably hire this year. Then 27% in September had preliminary plans. They've been given, uh, they had an idea. They've been given some numbers that they uh, targets to shoot for that, that, that they expected to hire, the company expected to hire. Uh, another 27% um, had definite hiring terms, they absolutely knew how many people they needed to, needed to bring into the organization. And then there was this large group, 37%, that's to be decided. Uh, these were that they were actively recruiting, 66% were actively seeking through career centers potential talent, but had no idea, no idea how many of the organization was going to be authorized to hire. And they come from different groups. They come from small, small, mid-sized companies. Uh, but again, if they're under 100, uh, they're more likely to make a commitment to hire, and they're not going to be uh, in this group. Uh, you can see that ag and construction had uh, were 
more likely to be decided. Ag has uh, some serious supply chain problems and others, and they just uh, don't know. That's with the exception of, uh, we'll see in a minute, in manufacturing side of ag. Uh, but construction, uh, it may not be in Florida so much, but everywhere else, uh, a lot of places, construction has had to spread out uh, their work because of their supply chain problem. They can't get product. They can't get the inputs they need, uh, particularly in residential housing. So for example, around here, a lot of them have spread their work out because it's just too costly to build. In fact, we were going to have some house, uh, some re final remodeling done on our house and our contractor just came and said, look, let's put this off nine, 10 months. The input costs are just so huge. It makes it not economically viable for what you want to do. And that's happening in a lot of places. They've had to slow down. You know, they can't get wood. They can't get uh, a lot of the inputs that they need because the supply chain has been uh, disrupted and not expected to get back into sync until spring. Um, some of the other things you might look up, uh, might be interesting is we ask what the situation, how they view the labor market for new college grads. Is it is it poor or is it really really good? And fifty three percent of of the, these uh, employer uh, college recruiters said it's still good to excellent despite the COVID. Uh, the interesting thing that is almost forty percent lower than the last previous five years which has been averaging almost 90% uh, um, or above. 70% uh, believe that their, their, their own personal business is doing much better uh, than everybody else and still, but that's almost down uh, over 22 percentage points. So there has been an erosion of confidence in the labor market, but it isn't collapsed like we saw in 2008 or 2000. While 41% are gonna decrease hiring, 36% said they're gonna increase their hiring and they kind of offset each other. So that's the situation going into the fall. Uh, and, and how I don't, and how, and this is what it looks like in numbers. Um, and you can see uh, that the overall picture is pretty positive for us associate degrees. You can see the bachelor's degree is down minus one percentage point, but that's statistically not different in zero. So uh, everybody's kind of holding and waiting at the bachelor's degree. You can see that MBAs are not doing well, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and the master's are off. And uh, I won't talk a lot about the master's. What's really going on there is that the master's in business, not the MBA mass, uh, B, but the master's in business are down. Uh, while your health professionals and others that are in this group are up or holding their own. So let me go to the degrees. You notice that the associate degrees have been doing very, very well. Uh, employer, uh, in fact, associate degrees have been the, the main steady degree uh, through this whole recovery. They recovered early. Uh, employers have been 10 actively looking for degrees, uh, particularly in applied engineering, applied technologies, uh, computer science, IT, and health uh, technicians. Uh, that's where the dominant is. Um, I should caution here that uh, the labor markets for associate degrees are very regional specific. Uh, while I have a a number of employers that tap into uh, these degrees. Uh, they're not generalizable across the United uh, entire state uh, country, nor within even a state. I can I can pull, pull uh, a community college within Michigan that's in a, uh, a region this economy is doing very well and they're heavy demand, and I can go uh, a couple hundred miles away to another community college district that doesn't have the regional dy uh, economic dynamics and their students are really hurting, but they're locked in. They usually stay there. Uh, so that so you have to be careful how you interpret it. Uh, unfortunately, two-year schools have lost a significant enrollment at exactly the wrong time. There tends to be a lot of need for these uh, graduates, right? Uh, out of their credential programs and two year degree programs. And a lot of the students that dropped out were low income that didn't have the economic viability to stay in school. And they, and they tend to be underrepresented and we need to find ways to support those students. 
At the bachelor's level, the nice thing about here is we didn't see a collapse of labor market in bachelor's. It's not reminiscent of 2008 or 2000. Employers held. Uh, they didn't desert. They, they, they certainly raised, certainly raised questions. Uh, there's still a need for full-time hires, uh, and, it, and it's fluctuating. Uh, it might be, it, right now, it probably looks pretty uh, iffy about how strong the labor market is. I think when you get the latter part of summer and spring into March, April, uh, from different parts of the country, uh, the labor market will pick up quite quickly. Uh, and we'll, we'll just have to see what the long-term income impacts are. What's troubling here is that the economy can, tends to continue to weaken uh, given the onslaught of the virus. The, the new uh, numbers for unemployment uh, filings is um, rather significantly up this last couple of weeks. So there's red flags up. But I think right now, this bachelor's mayor market's going to hold. Now you can compare the results in this report and the regional report may not agree with necessarily what you're seeing. Uh, I have uh, accounting as down uh, in, in, across in, those that hire accounting. The firms are tending to hire fewer. Uh, Initially, I thought that was a problem because it didn't jive with some of the other data out there like Glassdoor. But in working with the Bureau of Labor Statistics in November and looking at their year over year reports, the finance sector and accounting were down. Uh, and so there is some adjustments going on there. Maybe it's not affecting you in, in, in the region in Florida, but it's certainly having a national perspective. The MBAs is on a roller coaster. It didn't come out of the, it delayed coming out of the recession of 2008. It's been up and down. Last couple of years have been much more positive, uh, but it, it, it's getting hurt right now. Uh, employers don't invest in high priced labor in times of high uncertainty, uh, but that's not the only problems. MBAs have seen enrollment problems, uh, particularly in face-to-face -face classes. So there's been a surge in online MBA programs. Uh, for the example, University of Illinois now has a universal uh, MBA for 22,000. Uh, that's price pointed has been significant uh, and will certainly influence MBA hiring. Uh, my word of advice here to any student out there in trying to avoid a, a, a perceived uh, poor labor market is going for an MBA without a lot of work experience is not a good investment. You will not recover that investment. Employers are looking uh, for more for experience than uh, degrees for uh, advanced degrees uh, for the kind of jobs they have available for. Uh, and so it's, it's investment will take a long, long time to pay off. Here's where we begin to see some of the discrepancies and meandering patterns that don't hold well in this recession, given what's going on because of the uh, in different parts of the country. We see that uh, when we break it down by size organization, we see these mid-size companies um, decreasing the number of employers, and then we see uh, organizations that bracket these companies increase the employment, and it's these latter three. They're kind of holding the labor market together right now. So it's your mid-sized firms that haven't uh, had to adjust as much or maybe hadn't fully come back from 2008, but they're holding their hiring. A large, some very large employers are doing well. Uh, even after I took out some employers that are, uh, a couple employers that are doing staggering, have a staggering number of hires. Um, um, and the same way in, in the industries here as you begin to see the real K recovery. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the business professional scientific service sector. Uh, that sector is really important to new college grads. It contains everything from law and CPA firms to veterinary medicine. And the biggest subsectors are happen to be in computer services, computer sci uh, development, uh, software development, uh, engineering services and engineering development, uh, and marketing, uh, PR and advertising, and scientific research. What happens in this subsector is you see computer science and research doing very, very, very well. Um, the research side is being driven by the need for bent scientists to run all these lab tests for COVID. 
uh, it, I hope it'll probably be short run, but right now uh, the need for bench scientists is quite high. Uh, on the other hand, engineering services has shrunk quite a bit as uh, that market has suffered. And I already told you about marketing, PR, and advertising. Accommodation sector, uh, there's obviously death-defying spiral for restaurants and uh, 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 food services. The hotels were starting to make a comeback until this set, this next round of virus, and most of those have had to retreat. Uh, education uh, has been really good in uh, respondents to this survey. They were the survey went out to them at exactly the wrong time. Most of the K twelve schools were trying to figure out how to start school. Uh, was it going to be um, in class, hybrid, or totally online, depending on where you were and the politics uh, around that. Uh, but a uh, number of them did respond that, yes, we're going to be hiring. We just don't know how many. We know we're going to have teachers leave uh, the profession as a result of this. We also know that we're going to have to have new teachers. And hiring has been up in, in education. They expect it to be up in fall. Their numbers are kind of so-so uh, right in at this time. Nonprofits, for those that are able to stay open and keep going, uh, there are huge demands on their services as people have, uh, and families and individuals have been stressed in this environment we're in. Uh, they have been hiring, um, though uh, the giving to nonprofits has not been uh, sustained as well as they hope. Uh, and then government is up in this survey, but with lots of red flags. Uh, most of the government respondents says, well, we just don't know what the new budgets are. These are the hirings we're planning for, but come uh, January and with new budgets, uh, we may not be able to sustain that hiring. Some sectors are different. Uh, retail is up. You, if you look at the December job report, actually uh, retail was hirings were up. A lot, some of it was seasonal. Uh, but it's not as much seasonal as you would expect. Uh, the e-universe has just taken over retail. Brick and mortars are in real danger of going out of existence. I said that manufacturing uh, is by is is has divergent uh, going on. In you see real strong growth in food and beverage, uh, and chemicals and plastics, but not petrochemicals. Uh, chemicals and plastics are carrying auto aerospace and metals and the la uh, aerospace is really uh, being dampened down by domestic aerospace, even though Boeing may have finally got its, some of its problems worked out, uh, the demand for uh, domestic aerospace is way, way down. Uh, defense aerospace and defense in general is keeping that part of the sector going. Health uh, is, is more alignment of resources and how they're allocated than anything else. Uh, when COVID spiked, they pulled all the resources into COVID and those folks in health that uh, were not in, in position, they may be in an outpatient surgery. Uh, my daughter was in cardiology and heart and they had to close down operations and stuff. So they, they got their hours cut back. Uh, then they got them back again. And then again, when the second wave came, it particularly hit their area pretty hard. And they were, they were actually cutbacks again. So what's happened is health has, got, has had trouble keeping everybody in play uh, despite the huge need for health professionals around COVID. Uh, transportation is another sector that's divergent. Uh, the air, air segment is, is weak except for, uh, and that's in commercial, uh, but when you look at air, like the tr uh, transporting all those boxes that we ordered, they're doing quite well. And trucking is really strong, other than COVID has really taken a hit on truckers. Um, and then I said, that, uh, the finance sector, I had mixed results on finance. They didn't align with other studies. And I said, they came out, um, with the Bureau of Labor Six and tends to suggest that my data may not be that far off. Um, let's go to talent management programs quickly. Um, so what happened in talent management programs? This is where we took the big hammer hit uh, when COVID came. Um, first, uh, when we ask about adjustments, uh, 
40, almost 40 percent said immediately they couldn't hire, they couldn't adapt quick enough uh, to handle uh, interns with the, on, and their facilities. So they didn't hire any interns or they had to rescind their offers. 27 percent said they went ahead and brought on interns, but not near at the number that they planned to host. And then the, about 42% continued to hire, uh, bring on their interns. They were able to adjust either physically in adjusting their physical spaces or they went to virtual. And we're gonna talk a lot about virtual here in a minute. Um, but um, there's some other changes that went on that weren't directly the result of employers, but, but affected employers. A, a number of colleges and universities shut down their credit bearing uh, internship programs. Uh, one that I was involved in because I was doing research with them because they were not uh, initiating it, uh, wouldn't let any of their uh, credit bearing, the institution decided not to let any of their in, interns go out. Uh, and so they canceled those programs. Uh, and, and so a lot of employers who thought they might be able to support those students were left without interns. Uh, and, and, and again, we know that number of parents kept their sons and daughters at home and wouldn't let them intern either. So the adjustments that we had to make in the internship co-op side were significant. I mean, and we talk about internship co-op, but the uh, others like uh, clinicals for nurses and social workers and other health professionals had to had to stop so they had to delay their clinicals and unique ways were created to complete those. Uh, there were student teachers actually could uh, go online and continue their student teaching, um, but a lot of adjustments had to be made in this area. Those that did take on interns um, uh, 30 percent said they worked virtually 100 percent on site because they couldn't do it virtually and then the, the other there was a number of combinations of uh blended rotations uh or they split their internship pool into on-site and and then the others were hosted virtually uh, so it was a mix of things a lot of virtual internships um what were they going to do this year okay going into the fall 10% said they're definitely not going to hire. 27% said they were going to wait till January and February and decide whether they're going to bring on interns. And those people are pretty much not optimistic that they're going to bring on interns. 37% uh, said they're going to hire. Uh, some said they're going to hire more and a few less. If I missed anything in this survey, it's the rapid um, increase in the demand for virtual internships that we've seen on most of our uh, hosting platforms over the last uh, since October, uh, we're going to see that employers have figured out those that were delayed have figured out how to maybe bring on virtual interns. I think uh, employers that worked with virtual interns have now smoothed out uh, the kinks and are more confident that they can supply internships and they see some positive aspects of the virtual internship, and so we're going to see much more activity. What we did ask employers that were dealing with virtual internships and had, had gone in the summer to virtual internships, uh, what their experience is like. Now, virtual internships are not new. Now, we've been around, very small groups use them. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we, um, and mostly it's in IT and places that are, are more likely to see um, uh, have experiences with remote uh, opportunities. So we asked them, what were the things that you learned from this experience that will really help that makes this work? Uh, and the first thing they said, it's all about communication. It is so important to communicate. You've got to set clear schedules, uh, You've not only with this, the intern, but with the, with the supervisor and with the staff. Uh, you have to use Zoom uh, to actually illustrate things you're, you, they want them to do uh, and explain assignments. That's one. The second, another thing that's really important is you've got to play, provide very clear expectations to the intern and the supervisor about what's going to be done in this assignment. And you have to express some guidelines for working uh, remotely. 
The third thing is that you have to structure the workflow ahead of time. You've got to think through these assignments ahead of time. You can't just uh, put them in a work and do what you do might happen when you're on site, when a, an intern has an assignment and something comes up and you have to shift them uh, to, to some other work temporarily and uh, they can do that. In remote work, you can't do that. So you have to plan ahead and you just can't sign things to crop up. Uh, you have to collaborate. Now, you, we do a lot of collaboration between stu uh, the institution, the student and the organization. But what they're talking about here is you have to collaborate more internally within the organization, because as your interns become in, uh, visible to many of the members of the organization and the work that goes on and flows through there is dependent on some of the things the intern does, it's important to collaborate between teams and, and the supervisors with interns so that they know what's going on. Obviously, then it takes a lot of pre-planning with your supervisor. And out of this came in a very important understanding that uh, you're going to have to mentor, uh, and a mentor in addition is important. And that can that can jive with some research that we have uh, pub, uh, get, or have submitted for publication on the role of mentors in internships. And there's a lot of technology issues that crop up. Students don't always have the tech support. They don't they don't have access to go in and sit in Starbucks with free Wi-Fi. <clears throat> and so uh, there was efforts had to be made to provide either actual hardware uh, that, that would be conducive to doing assignments or provide them, uh, their interns with Wi-Fi support. Okay, so let me shift then to technology and how it's gonna shape the future. Uh, just some quick questions we ask about how they were gonna use technology during this year. A number of the discussions I had in the spring and early summer with employer panels and employer groups that, had me sit in and, and talk about what they were doing. A lot of questions were, are we just gonna focus on a few schools and do their uh, virtual events? Are we gonna open it up and be willing to go to multiple school events and other things? So uh, interesting enough, uh, two thirds said they're gonna go to specific targeted events at schools and two thirds said, we're gonna just go to all, all the kind of events we can do. And that's basically what employers have been doing much of the fall is trying to attend as many um, virtual events as possible. 30% said that they had about uh, their own virtual platforms and that they were gonna use them. Uh, this was kind of quiet, but it's become very active in the last couple months of, uh, of of companies and organizations seeing the benefit of having some of their own virtual platforms. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, uh, but, uh, and they're doing more with their own platforms and not the platform, other options that are out there. Uh, some are gonna to agree to more schools, some aren't. Uh, some plan to attend fewer schools, but most aren't. Uh, and the tools that they're generally relying on up front are the ones that are visible to everybody, the college and university employment management systems, whether it's Handshake Simplicity or whatever. Uh, and for, in the use of virtual career fairs, this number has soared because at the time we took the survey, uh, a lot of the folks that responded said they had never been in a virtual career fair. Uh, so uh, that number has really soared. Why are we gonna use LinkedIn? And I would add here based on the open-ended comments that <clears throat> indeed is being heavily used at this time. As you come back to that comment on just in time hiring. And then there's the usual group that are using social media. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some of these virtual events. Let's talk about virtual career fairs. They've been around for a while. They get slammed uh, by uh, everyone. Uh, students don't like them. Uh, employers don't like them. But there's situations that just have to be served by virtual career fairs. So we, we actually stepped into this and now everybody's had to be uh, taken care of. And um, what we found here when we asked them the what the perceived benefits and uh, costs of virtual career fairs, the answers were quite distinctive. Uh, in fact, we got a pretty good benefit cost ratio out of this. Uh, in fact, 
the not so good, the it says that really the biggest thing centers around the absence of in-person connections. I mean, that is um, significant. I mean, we like to have those in-person connections. We like to make those uh, introductions. We wanna have those conversations. They miss that. Then there was a whole bunch of technology issues that the technology platforms uh, are poor, poorly structured. They're not very accommodating. There's no standards. So if I'm in multiple events at different schools on the same day, I'm going back between technology standards and their next step. And then there's some issues about students uh, not attending or they, uh, but not all events. Some were, will attend. The question about promoting to students and Students just aren't prepared to carry on the kind of conversations that have to occur in the time and limits that are imposed on uh, uh, these on these platforms. Having said that, when you look at the benefits, they're de quite distinct. Uh, there's going to be tremendous there's tremendous cost savings. They save from uh, these some of them call exorbitant prices to attend campus career fairs, but it also includes uh, the, the the cost of uh, per diem and lodging and transportation, shipping materials and all that. But the biggest one is the better use of staff and professional time. Most uh, organizations have to bring some professional staff with them that are not in college recruiting uh, to make those events work, particularly at large campuses. That pulls them away from the office. They can't get things done. Now they can come those professional time, come and spend an hour, hour and a half on a, a virtual fair and then go back to work and not uh, jeopardize their workflow and other things they have to do. They did find that they were more receptive to the kind of students they found, and they did find qualifying students. And many of them commented, if, if we do this right, it improves our ROI. So I think virtual career fairs, and we'll talk about this in a minute, are going to be around for a while. Uh, it's going to have some implications um, about what's going on, uh, but this is here to stay. Uh, this is going to impact on the career side in a big way, uh, but you're going to see hybrid uh, environment around career fairs. Let's go to the virtual internships. This one, the benefit costs are not uh, as distinct. Uh, there, there really are uh, limitations on the virtual internship. I think it's going to form a niche. I think it's going to expand the niche that it's in and it's going to be receptive. But really, the disadvantages for many companies is that there's an overall program experience in these early talent management programs that is missed. It's the connections, the conversations, it's the hands on experience, it's the all kinds of things uh, that, uh, that they expect more than just doing a task. Now, if your company organization is not into the organizational fit, uh, my, uh, I, mindset and you want and you're just worried about uh, students doing tasks then the virtual internship can 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 work out for you uh, further it takes a lot of supervision by uh, supervisors um, and again the communication issues and the advantages is that it does provide a safe environment as long as we need it there are some cost savings particularly to students that they don't have to buy housing um, and find housing. Uh, and they do feel that, that there's some, some skills that are through the experience that students can learn uh, and that th there's advantages to very clear messaging, but the, the advantages aren't as distinct as we saw for careers. What you're gonna see here are uh, companies leveraging virtual internships depending on their situation. Uh, for example, I've already talked to some companies that are uh, excited about the possibility of retaining um, interns that they want to bring on as full-time employees uh, when they go back to campus. Uh, they, can, they can offer them work in a virtual way with the team that they were on on site. Uh, same way, a kind of variation on that. Uh, companies were telling me that, well, we, we have students that come and work us during the academic year uh, because our facilities are next to their campus. When they go home for the summer, uh, we have no way to accommodate them because uh, we don't have any facilities there. But now with the virtual internship, they can keep them employed uh, and, and engaged with the organization. So I think there's a niche there, It's going, to, but it's not gonna be a dominant thing. I think most companies are gonna want that in on-site, in-house experience. 
Uh, looking ahead, uh, uh, we see some things going on. Let me point out a couple. We're going to see the acceleration in the use of virtual recruiting strategies. It's just a given. I was on a call uh, with major uh, uh, tech firms. Most of them were tech firms, not all of them, uh, in early mid-December as a wrap up to the year. And most of them were talking about their college recruiting. Most, some of them admitted, we got all admitted that they got completely caught unaware and unprepared and had to make rapid adjustments. But what they've seen is that they're gonna have to integrate more. So many of them are now even teaming together to build uh, better uh, virtual career fairs, um, software, better virtual interviewing software. Uh, these are major, major companies. I mean, these are the top top companies and they're working together uh, and they're gonna integrate it. And companies are already talking about integrating this directly into their applicant tracking systems. Uh, this is what companies have wanted all along. And you're gonna see that happen more and more and more. Uh, and that's going to have a big impact on virtual recruiting. So let me give you some examples. So this is a large uh, food and beverage organization uh, said, well, look, we have facilities all over and we have a active college recruiting, uh, but we only go to selected schools. And then we try to find enough students there to send to all our facilities. And it doesn't always work. Now, what we found out is we'll, we'll go to those schools, we'll go to their career fairs, our, our core schools, but we're going to offer uh, virtual career fairs. Uh, for, with our own platform, we're going to invite students that are from campuses that are nearer to our uh, other facilities, and they found that this works very, very well. The other thing, and this will be upsetting to some in the career service realm, but what employers are finding is we can find students that are uh, using the openness of the platforms, whether it's Handshake or Simplicity, to find a number of students. So we find out we can get 50 or 60, 70 students that are interested in our company and we'll host our own career fair. Um, and this is what's gonna happen. Um, then uh, when it comes to students, uh, there's a significant growing need to look closer at credentials and certificates other than academic degrees. This number keeps growing uh, as the demand in the workplace and for different kind of work uh, skills and competencies. So we're look, uh, companies are looking at how uh, work and learning can be leveraged through other options besides a degree. Uh, this is going to be uh, a big. Then the biggest one, and I said the big experiment is remote learning. Just under 50% of the respondents said, yes, uh, we are going to see uh, a lot more uh, focus on remote uh, working for our, uh, our staff. Uh, if you live along salt water, which Florida does on the East Coast and West Coast, this number is actually above 60%. Uh, in the Midwest, it's down a little bit lower than this. It's in the low 40s, but that's because we have so much more manufacturing uh, and, it's, and, and it's not conducive to remote work. And plus, given a uh, manufacturing mindset, there's some hesitancy about uh, doing remote work. But remote work is now a reality. It's going to make a shift on where people live. It's going to have a shift on uh, commercial uh brick and mortar space, uh, and a lot of implications will come out of this. Uh, is it too early to tell if it's what's going to stick as far as technology? Some said, about a third said it's too early to tell. We're not sure of the changes. Another small, about 20% said, no, it's going to go back to normal. Uh, and we're just going to do what we always do. But the biggest group was what I called the blend. Uh, it's a balance between virtual and in-person. It's going to be more a common, a realigning things um, and doing things different and thinking out new ways uh, to interact. There's going to be as much emphasis on in-person as virtual, but a lot of the things like interviewing career fairs uh, and things are and, and, uh, um, job shadowing are going to be done virtually while the uh, in-person will be more targeted and more personable and more in-depth. Students have to accept these changes. They will just have to understand that many steps in the recruiting process are gonna go virtual. No matter how much they don't like them, no matter how much surveys say they don't like, companies are not, gonna, are not moving uh, 
back to traditional as much as they were thinking. And within the blended group, there was two hopes, two bone hopes. One, they think that by blending, there'll be more trust built into the recruiting process, something that they think is done. And the big hope is that we're gonna get a lot better technologies than we currently have. With that, then it may has career big implications for the relationship between career services and employers. And now we got a lot of employers here. So we'll be glad, almost all of you are employers. So we'll be glad to see what you have to say about this. But the biggest things that they have three big takeaways from where they think uh, the direction of uh, the relationship going. One, it's going to increase communication significantly. The need for communications, the ability to communicate. Virtual technologies open more information and we can have timely conversations. We don't have to simply rely when we come to campus, uh, those occasional telephone calls. We need to stay informed. It's clear out of this COVID experience. The more you stay in, in connected and informed, the better off you are. That means we have to collaborate and, re, and build relationships that are uh, deeper and uh, stronger than we've had before because we need to be able to know what students are doing. We have to be able to open channels to students, student organizations. We have to be able to promote and uh, organizations and brands and opportunities in different ways. And it's gonna take those relationships to do that. That means that we're gonna see more proactive, innovative and creative work going on. I can't give you good examples of this. I'm just really excited about this. I think there's this is opening uh, un, uh, is one of the serendipitous things about events like this, uh, as tragic as it is, is that it opens ideas to be creative and innovative about how we're going to work together. And I think uh, it, I think career service folks uh, are finally realizing that uh, they may they need to change their expectations, and it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful financially for many of them. Uh, but it's going to come. Now, there's two situations that they also point out to make this work. One is the career center. The career professionals on campus are the responsible folks to train, educate, and coach students how to deal with the virtual world in recruiting, how to research, how to prep for interviews, how to engage employers in a different way by being first introduced to them virtually. Uh, it, it, we can't just uh, let this, the whiners are not going to win in this. I'm sorry. You can pound the table as much as you don't like this. It's just not going to happen. I think the biggest challenge that they, they to the, this happening is not the individuals in the career space, not the career service folks at all. It's what the institutions will do in providing resources and support to career services. Uh, we got a career services got a huge boost out of the recession in 2008, but the financial situation in higher ed is serious, uh, and what it is one of the top five sectors in losing jobs uh, during this recession. Many of them will not come back, uh, and so uh, and the and the financial crisis is only going to continue to get. Uh, worse than again, the, the good, the big elite schools will continue to uh, survive, and the other uh, a lot of schools are going to struggle. And when they see financial situations like this, uh, employers are concerned whether the institution leadership will put in the required uh, resources to build and sustain the, where the, where this is going to. Nothing. This does not reflect the people in it at all. It's not a people thing. It's a resource. Uh, commitment by the top administration. So let me wrap up. When you get your Southwest Regional Report, I've had, I usually try to pull out Florida by itself. I couldn't this year. The responses were, were lower. You got the surveys and employers and it came out uh, when you were dealing with some high rates of uh, the virus for the first time. So there was a unexpected low there. So I had to combine them, but here's just some highlights. Uh, 14% of the employers in this region did not hire in 2020. 13% uh, are not hiring or dis de delaying recruiting this year. Uh, that's a little bit lower. 32% are to be decided. So that's a little bit lower. 34% uh, are not hiring interns this year or the decision will be dis uh, 
delayed and 34% did not hire interns in 2020. According to the responses in the poll, uh, that number was quite a bit higher, higher among the people that are attending today. Uh, the hiring is somber in that this region. Uh, associates are increased. Uh, there's an uptick in MBAs. MBA uh, and MBAs are down and a slight adjustment in masters. And it varies by size with very small and mid-size doing most of the hiring and very large employers are off. Now, I'm gonna give you a prelude to my last question before we go to questions answer, if there's any time left, uh, there's gonna be a few minutes. Uh, so my last question in the survey is when do we expect to, of this recovery? Remember, it's taken a long time to come out of 2008. It took a long time to come out of 2000. Uh, and each one has gotten progressive longer. So 60% of the employers in this region said that they would return to the good days in two to three years. 11% said it would take even longer. So 71% said it's going to take, now we've already been one year, so we, we, we've still got to go uh, into the second year. So it's going to take, you know, so this looks like it's going to take a two, three, four year recovery uh, to get back to where we were uh, a year ago at this time. Now, here's what the national report says, uh, and I kept the Southeast in there. Um, so it, it looks like it would 23%, 5% said nothing's changed for us. We're still hiring. Uh, everything remains good. 23% uh, said it would take a year. Well, that's not happened. Uh, it's gonna, it, unless we go to the spring. 68% uh, said it would take, uh, I mean, two to uh, two years, 38%, 30%, three to four years and 8% longer. So you can see 68, 74%, just about the same as in this region. Say so this is gonna, this is a two year to three year, if not longer rebuild. And we've lost a lot of firms and establishments that will never ever come back. We have decimated small employers, uh, mostly in the food uh, sector, uh, hospitality sector, but a lot of small uh, retail, small, uh, service folks that just couldn't sustain operations uh, given the shutdown and the lack of clients. With that then, Matt, we're going to open this up to your questions. I'm going to take this off screen so that everybody can see us. And uh, I want to thank everybody again for attending. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you in this way again. Well, with that, I know that we're all... Uh giving Dr. Gardner a, uh, a huge round of applause uh, and thanking him for his insights today and presentation. Dr. Gardner, I was following the, uh, the chat route and you were getting a lot of praise and remarks. Uh, a few questions did come in. Seems like our, our recruiters are um, very much uh, sympathizing with everything that you reported on and uh, having to rethink. A uh, question that did come up was, and it's kind of a two-parter, um, but kind of you mentioned earlier in your presentation about the uh, hotel uh, sector doing well or, or being promising. Maybe could you just go a little bit more and elaborate as to why you think hotels are promising? Well, you know, back in September, uh, re you know, food and, and dining was still, uh, you know, limited to uh, outside dining and things like that. So they were still in trouble, but hotels have begun to open up again. We're get, promoting travel. They were beginning to hire a little bit. Again, there were, they had a win, we had a window from August until October where people tried to relax. I mean, for example, Disney began to open up and, and Orlando began to open up and things like that. And we began to see some opening. So a, I, this is why I cautioned the beginning. We saw some early excitement. Right now, uh, if I, I imagine with the, the COVID the way it is that hotels are uh, struggling again um, and, and keeping their capacity, they were they, and so they probably aren't hiring as much. It just depends on where you are, what the political environment in your uh, region is towards opening and closing. Our hotel capacity is is started to rebound and and since with the concerns since 
the holidays began in November have been grossly under capacity because we did, in, in this state, we didn't travel as much as some other states. So uh, people weren't on the move. Uh, other places uh, are, dan so it's, it's sick. This oscillation of COVID messes this whole hospitality sector up. So yes, we did see some recovery signs of early recovery. And then it probably, by the time my report came out, it got cut off in the hospitality sector. Yeah, I think I was even uh, getting uh, emails or getting solicitation from hotels to rent for the day uh, as a uh, as an office. Uh, they were doing day rates. They didn't even have to do overnight. Come use our amenities. Come use our coffee, our Wi-Fi. But you know, if you don't want to work from home or don't have a home office, so yeah. um, that's an interesting question. Same question from our uh, same Ginger asked one other question that I wanted to address. Uh, which I think a lot of us, it's on our mind. Um, the preferred technology for conducting virtual interviews uh, has primarily been Zoom, Facebook, and WhatsApp. Prior to COVID, they were solely using Skype uh, and now switching over to Microsoft Teams. Any feedback on kind of where you see, like I said, this pull of, you know, um, like what, what is the preferred platform? I don't know if we have a preferred. I think, I, I didn't get a sense that there's a preferred one uh, over any other. But I, what I will say is based on my talk to the tech community, and I, I will admit th these are the people like, you know, uh, IBM and Cisco and Intel and uh, Google and all those people that I was on that top Twitter and all those, they are absolutely committed to finding uh, a better solution uh, to these uh, times. I think Zoom will evolve quickly, Slack's gonna evolve quickly, uh, or somebody's gonna buy them up and, and re reinvent them. I think we, we're at the initial cusp, uh, and, and, and as particularly uh, the people that have the resources to make those advances have had to dabble in it, they, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna find those. So I think you're gonna see some technology come out of here, but I have no idea. I mean, it's a personal preference. Uh, we're on Zoom today. I, I'm comfortable with Zoom. Uh, I've tried a couple of the other platforms. They, uh, they, I feel a little more restricted. And then I, but I, but I haven't had a chance to use a lot of them. I just think uh, this is a, this experimentation that went on with more companies having to use them and seeing. Okay, now this is how it works. This is how it doesn't work. But I think the driving force behind whatever technology wins is how it's going to be able to integrate in your applicant tracking systems. That's where the key is. Going. It's got everything. I mean, the Gartner reports just came out on technology and the whole focus of the report was on if it's, if it's going to be worth anything, then all these things have to be integrated. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where it's going. Uh, I said, I was one of the employers said we've already integrated interviewing and we're looking at, uh, you know, we're going to get we're going to get a uh, um, a virtual career fair because we think it has great application. We're going to build it in so the people that attend are already in our applicant tracking system. We know and we got information on them. They're already so. I think that I'd like to divert the question. Is I don't know what's the best preference is, but I do know that a lot of work is going on on how to integrate this software and this and this result. You're going to get better software. Yeah, the, the integration and building the uh, digital bridge as they continue to talk to each other would be quite helpful. I know for us, uh, learning a new technology every uh, every other month is uh, uh, rewarding, but also taxing at times. Another great question came in, Dr. Gardner, if you've got some time here still. Um, are there any insights into what interns or recent graduates may be looking for in a company when going through the internship or job search? Well, oh, I haven't looked at that in light of the COVID situation. Um, when students, it depends on, I mean, there's not one universal checklist that I can go down and say students are. There's the students that are conscientious that know that uh, they want a work experience as part of their curriculum and plan for it tend to be more uh, prepared so they know what they want. They want uh, an environment that's collegial. They want where they're gonna have to be challenged. They want some variety to know that uh, they are going to, 
see a little bit bigger part of the organization than just doing one task. Uh, they want to have some career guidance. They want to see what the opportunities are. If not in the organization, what, how can you leverage uh, my, what I know, my degree in this kind of position, where does it lead to? What, what are the opportunities? Uh, and uh, they want to be given uh, feedback and advice uh, in a way that uh, they can continue to learn. Negative feedback they don't like, but now for students that just are grabbing anything uh, because they need an internship, uh, really don't have a list of things, they'll just take what they can get, uh, which isn't probably uh, good for either party because they'll get what they get and they then they'll be unhappy about it or the employer will get something that they're not really happy with. Um, I haven't, but I don't know COVID has checked, how that's checked it out. I'm sure parents are really worried about uh, safety uh, mm -hmm. and uh, for, and is, is the, if it's gonna be on site, is the facility uh, re acted responsibly for um, work distancing and things like that. But I haven't. I, I don't have that information right now. Yeah. No. I think you bring up a good point about you. You had mentioned earlier about the increase in communication and the importance for making sure we're all on the same page. So I imagine interns going through the process, uh, that type of information of what the company is doing and how they're addressing it. I also uh, I keep my notes every year from your presentations and remember uh, you talking about you know these recruiters and finding ways to not ghost uh, our students or our students ghosting them. So it kind of goes in line with that commit, uh, consistent communication throughout the search process. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, the last question here, because uh, I haven't seen any new ones pop up other than this, and I think this very much ties to uh, you know our Spartan Ready and how we recently introduced digital literacy into the foundation, but uh, what qualities or skills are students lacking in this pandemic world that employers are looking for? Well, I think that the biggest one is and it's and it's been there all along. It's adaptability uh, and it's having a closed mindset uh, or mind. Uh, I've got I, you know students coming into the workplace uh, are looking for a job. They definitely want this kind of job, but they won't consider anything else. And employers have to think, want them to think, be open minded because. The places to start have changed. Uh, this COVID has has altered the places you're going to start, but you can get where you want to go by starting here. You've got to be able to adapt it, your your expectations and things. It's just it, it things have changed quite a bit, uh, and I think those are the two things. So you've got to be prepared. Students have to be prepared. They have to be prepared for interacting with us in ways that you hadn't expected, we hadn't expected, uh, but it's gonna happen through these virtual, it's not a virtual. You have to be uh, patient because this, this process takes is different paced uh, and you have to be persistent. It's gonna take in time. So uh, persistence and resiliency, adaptability, and op being open-minded are the three things that employers would encourage that they don't often see among students right now um, that, that would make the difference. I think that's amazing. And um, you know, again, I could not agree more. Uh, looks like Erica dropped a, a question in and, and um, again, stop me if we uh, have to do our last two or three here, but this is a great one. Uh, just in thinking of some of the, the news outlets uh, and the, the big uh, gender gap in those being let go from companies. Um, the question is, can, can you confirm uh, that more uh, women than men are being let go? And if so, uh, what can be done to support this gender equality in hiring? Uh, I, I, I haven't looked at the recent numbers. I will tell you this, that women have taken a big hit in this environment for a number of reasons. It's not just that they, they may be let go. Uh, in, on higher ed, in the, on the faculty, they've had their research more constricted than men. Uh, and it's been quite noticeable on publications and things like that. But what's really hurting women uh, is the same old tale, is that they working from home uh, may sound neat, but they still responsible for the kids that are now 
at home because they're they're, they're the schools and stuff. And, and, and it's sad, but a lot of employers haven't been too sympathetic about that. Uh, if you're at home and you're working, you're expected to be working. And if the kids run through your Zoom, pre uh, behind your Zoom preference, then you must not be working. Uh, and, and we thought we'd gotten past some of that, but it, obviously we haven't. Um, other than that, you know, and, and so women are not being laid off so much as they're choosing to leave the workforce is what I hear. Uh, because they can't deal with all these and, and how they come come back and re-engage in the workplace uh, will be telling uh, and how employers will uh, accommodate uh, women working remotely without penalizing them uh, for childcare. Now, some of that will be alleviated once uh, kids are back in school, but still for, for younger women that have kids that are in uh, younger than and than kindergarten age uh they're still they seem they've been taking the bulk of them so men have not withdrawn from the mar market because they don't have those same kind of responsibilities so that's why that's big that's what i read is the biggest difference uh and so we're losing a, a lot of women their participation rates have dropped significantly uh and the question is, are we going to get them back? Yeah, uh, a question related to that, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll deem this the last question in our closing remarks, um, but can you speak to strategies for diversity recruitment, specifically um, you know, within the lens of race and uh, ethnicity? Okay, so I'm going to, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on this because it's so important. I do have a lot of data on uh, prior to COVID about DEI. Uh, I gave a presentation just recently to MPACE uh, using that information on how employers are recruiting, what, how th their strategies uh, and what they could be doing differently. Uh, I think this is gonna be a, a huge, It's it's been a critical issue, but what's this last year has shown us is how significant uh, inequality is, DEI is for a variety of number of reasons. And it's going to be a paramount on campus and in college recruiting that we deal with it. Uh, I, I would, if, if whoever answered that question or any of you, I'd be glad to share that slides deck with, with anybody. Uh, I've got uh, my former grad students were talking about how we're going to build out this information and share it. Uh, we, we've done several times since 2012 how to handle diversity recruiting. Um, and uh, let me just say NACE came out with a survey uh, on their employers that showed, you know, so many of them, and you would expect this in NACE, uh, to, to have uh, DEI plans, are committed to DEI. Um, but when I look at my surveys, which get a broader sense, more small employers, more mid-sized employers, most companies don't have plans. They're just winging it when it comes to DEI. So how do we help those? How does NACE, who has big player mentality, descale that to smaller companies to help uh, with these issues? And I will admit in my surveys, there are companies that really don't care about DEI but most companies do. They just don't know how to go about it. They don't know what the effective reach way is. They don't know how to reach the students. Uh, they don't know if they have the right tools to do it. Mm -hmm. And what I found in that study, you're gonna get me off on this now. And we did this statistical modeling on this. And this comes back, um, there's on-campus DEI things and there's on-campus DEI things. and. This was a causal model, and interestingly enough, career services was in the middle. It went both ways. If we want to effectively do EI, that's where career services move because they can do a link a lot to off-campus things as well as in-campus things. I think this is new insights. I said it's a it's a model we're trying to figure out how to use this, uh, but companies don't have to do this alone. Large companies have known how to uh really uh leverage on campus because that's where they're at but i think that um you know smaller companies working off campus 
with career services into affinity groups, into local communities can have a big impact on this DEI experience. I may be way wrong, but at least that's what my model, my causal model that we developed was showing us. And it's, and it was pretty strong. So we're trying to develop that, see if I have no mistakes in my data and, um, and then we might be able to, you know, come up with some ideas how to strengthen that. But this is probably along with remote working, the, the thing that's most relevant out of this last nine months uh, is how we're gonna handle DEI. Well, with that, um, I, I still see some questions coming in and I will take time to address those, but we will conclude Dr. Gardner's uh, program today. And uh, again, I'm gonna give him a uh, warm appreciation and a round of applause um, you mentioned earlier in the call that uh, it's starting to get some snow up there. So I think, you know, it's 71 and, and sunny here, but um, we continue to wish you the best. Uh, we, we you. You know, both, both Amanda and I dearly miss you. Uh, beginning of the year, it, it is such an honor to kick off an academic semester with bringing you on board and having all of our employers. And today you'll know that, I mean, we, we still have over 100 attendees uh, who have not yet signed off. So um, that's exciting to see folks that are still uh, trying to catch every last word. Um, and so, you know, again, want to say thank you. As the chat is coming in, I see folks are asking, uh, Amanda, would you like to say anything on behalf of the University of South Florida? I sure would. On behalf of USF and our Career Services Office, we really appreciate everyone joining today and certainly appreciate Dr. Gardner's insights. This has been fantastic and it is always a pleasure to hear from you, sir. So, um, and I will drop some in additional information into the chat channel. So if anyone has extra questions about USF or getting connected, please reach out. Thank you all. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, we'll keep that chat open for just a few more minutes. Um, in case there's folks asking questions. I, I think you saw earlier both Amanda and Alyssa shared um, with the new year comes a new academic semester and with a new academic semester comes yet another recruiting season. So as you can see, we've shared uh, our virtual fairs um, that'll be posted. Registration is open. Both Amanda and I uh, as employer relations, we are both handshake schools. So our registration links are up on Handshake. You'll see all that great information. Um, please do not hesitate to email us, connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, as I saw in the chat earlier today, a lot of you had questions about our student groups and our organizations and some of those targeted programs and workshops that we work very hardly to create, um, that we work hard to create. And so again, getting in touch with uh, our team and, and Amanda's team, we can help create a uh, specific recruiting plan that supports you uh, and doesn't just, um, again, leave you with not hitting your goals. So uh, reach out to us. Again, fairs are open, recruiting season's open. Uh, I save the date, just an innocent plug. Uh, the University of Tampa will be hosting our annual uh, Summer Institute, uh, which will be the week of uh, May 11th through the 13th. So once we get our fall students graduated and off into the workforce, um, we will do that institute. So there'll be more to come. I did drop a survey link into the chat. We will also send that survey, which is in a Qualtrics link out via email after today. Uh, I think you all know today's presentation was recorded, uh, actually is still being recorded. Uh, so once that downloads, we will get that uploaded. Dr. Gardner has graciously shared his presentation. Some of you were individually asking me if uh, they could get the presentation today send me an email and I'll send you the PowerPoint today. The presentation will be available on our website. Uh, and again, we hope to continue this conversation with you all uh, as we uh, continue to learn best practices and share from each other. Um, so again, we wanna thank you. Um, I think with that, if there's nothing else from Dr. Gardner or Amanda, I might hit that little red button